Good afternoon and welcome to the last session of the day. This is another day, another billion packets. My name is Steve Seymour. I am a principal solutions architect with AWS, and I'm one of our networking specialists working with customers across Europe, Middle East, and Africa. For the next 45 minutes, I want to take you through the journey that packets go on on the AWS network. And in fact, it might be more accurate to say I'm going to ex be explaining how packets flow from the edge of our network right the way through to an EC2 instance and give you an idea of some of the things that we thought about when we built VPC, Virtual Private Cloud. So you've probably seen diagrams like this. If you've been in sessions today, I'm sure you've seen many of them. This is a very simple architecture diagram, and it illustrates all of the components that I'm going to be talking through. So we're starting with connectivity from your data center, your co-location environment, your office, using services such as AWS Direct Connect, or VPNs, virtual private networks. We're also going to take a look at CloudFront, our content delivery network, and how that is used to provide content to your users, to your customers. How does that then connect back using the Amazon Global Network to our regions? And then within a region, what actually makes up a region? our availability zones, how do you configure subnets within those availability zones, and finally, launching EC2 instances where you actually run your workloads. So let's start with the connectivity from your data center, your environment into AWS. How does Direct Connect fit into things? So first of all, what is Direct Connect? Well, it's a service that we have that enables you to establish a dedicated private connection from your network into AWS. You can provision 1 gig connections, 10 gig connections, or multiples of 1 and 10 gig connections into various Direct Connect locations around the world, which are then associated with our AWS regions. They enable you to provide connectivity into your VPC, your virtual private cloud, or to our other public services. And it enables you to have consistent network performance with high bandwidth. We currently have 16 regions, and we have 60 Direct Connect locations as of yesterday around the world. These Direct Connect locations are associated with particular regions. And just as a, a bit of a snapshot here, I wanted to show you some of the Direct Connect locations across some of the European regions. And you can see there the three AWS regions associated with them. All of these Direct Connect locations then use the Amazon Global Network to connect back to the associated AWS region. So now let's look at it from a slightly different perspective. What about your users, your customers that are consuming content that actually you would like to cache at the edge of our network? This is where CloudFront fits. So CloudFront is our content delivery network. It's optimized for providing performance and has huge scale to enable the ability to provide your content close to your users. We have 88 edge locations around the world for CloudFront. 77 of those are actual points of presence, and 11 of those are what we call regional edge caches. You can see a list of them on the screen here, and most of those are also connected to the Amazon Global Network, reaching back into the associated re excuse me, regions where your content is being held. So I've mentioned the Amazon Global Network a couple of times there. Well, what actually is it? So this is the Amazon Global Network. It shows you some of the connectivity that we have around the world linking together these various Direct Connect locations, CloudFront pops, and of course, the AWS regions themselves. All of this infrastructure that you see on the screen here is managed by one company. It's managed by AWS. It's under our administrative control. So why do we have a, a global network? It perhaps seems like a, an obvious concept. But actually, this is all about improving the latency, reducing packet loss, and the overall quality of service we can deliver to customers connecting between our regions and those various points of presence that I mentioned. If your traffic is flowing between two AWS regions or between any of those locations that I mentioned, it's flowing over the AWS global backbone. These are obviously not small connections. These are multiple hundred gig connections. We have a huge amount of resiliency built into the AWS global network. And it means that should there be a failure or some maintenance in any particular part of this network, that's completely invisible to you, our customers. So we have huge amounts of capacity linking together all of these regions across the globe. So now that we've got our traffic to the AWS region, what happens here? So let's take a look at an actual AWS region. This is one of the, the 16 regions around the world that we have. 
And within that region, we have availability zones. All of our regions have at least two availability zones, and we actually have decided that new builds are probably always going to be three availability zones. That seems to be the right number for new regions. Some of our regions, though, have many more than three. So we have a region, for example, with three availability zones. And this is what makes up the core components of an AWS region. Two other important things that we have inside an AWS region, and these are the transit centers. And the transit centers are there to provide connectivity to the rest of the world. So they provide connectivity to the Amazon Global Network. They provide connectivity to our peers, to our transit providers, and obviously over that global network to our direct connect locations as well. So now that we've got our region, let's go in a little bit closer inside that region and look at an availability zone. So in this example, I'm showing two availability zones, A and B, and this is how it looks on your architecture diagrams. What does it look like in reality? So again, this is a, a real example that we're working through here. This is actually one of the AWS regions. And the first thing to mention is that an availability zone actually can be one or many data centers. We have some availability zones that have as many as eight data centers making up that particular availability zone. The connectivity within that availability zone in between the data centers is highly redundant. And just to give you an idea of the kind of scale, we have some availability zones with over 300,000 servers in them. So we've got these data centers, we've got these availability zones within the AWS region. We now need to connect them together. So the first thing to do is let's connect all those buildings together in the infrastructure in the individual availability zones. We now need to connect those availability zones to each other. We would recommend that when you deploy services onto AWS, you deploy them in a highly available fashion across multiple availability zones, and you're going to be using this network to exchange traffic between them. From there, of course, you want to be able to talk to the wider global network and out to the internet. That's where the transit centers fit in. So in this particular example, as I say, of a real AWS region, there are 126 unique spans of connectivity over 240,000 individual fiber strands providing the connectivity in this one region alone. And again, just to give you a little bit more detail about the infrastructure that's involved here, we have some cables that carry over 3,000 fibers in an individual cable. So this is the, the scale of an AWS region and how we build the infrastructure to connect those data centers and those availability zones together. So now that we're inside the availability zone, let's take a look at how we provide connectivity through to the rest of the infrastructure itself. So obviously, if we go back a, a good number of years, we took a look at old school routers. And we actually decided that this is not the path that we want to take. Old school routers are typically quite complex. They have lots of features that we don't actually need. And as a result, they can be potentially unreliable. They're often quite expensive and huge pieces of equipment. And if an issue is found, typically in a feature that we're not even using, actually it can take up to six months to get that particular issue fixed or investigated and resolved. So we took a slightly different approach, and we decided that we would custom build our routers. So the example that's on the screen here is a top of rack form factor. Um, and this is hardware that is built to our specification. It is our team that have written the software that runs within this piece of equipment. So we're in full control, and it only provides the features that we need to actually operate VPC. We also made some decisions quite early on that we would standardize on 25 gig connectivity. The industry was actually looking at pretty standard 10 gig connections and 40 gig. But actually, 40 gig is simply 4 times 10 four waves on a particular piece of fiber. And what we realized is that we could actually deliver 25 gig connectivity with a single wave and only a slight increase in the cost of the optics within this particular hardware. So as a result, we standardized on 25 gig. So we're now within a particular data center, within a particular availability zone, and we now need to have a bit of a closer look at the EC2 instances themselves. So those EC2 instances are running on physical hardware. How do we provide connectivity to that? Well, from the beginning, we've obviously been involved in providing software-defined networking. That, that's the definition of VPC. It's what we, we need to be able to provide. So right the way back at the beginning of EC2, we actually looked at this and said there's a whole bunch of functions that are being provided currently within the hypervisor that we could offload. So what we did is we actually developed a custom 10 gig NIC, network interface card, 
and we offloaded the virtualization of the network onto that card. This meant that we freed up resources on the actual server itself. We had cores then available that could be used by customers. And actually, it gave us the ability to deliver services such as SRIOV and enhanced networking. It enables features such as much lower latency because we're actually processing this now in hardware rather than in software. So this was back in 2012 when we did this. And there's an example on the screen there of the, the kinds of 10 gig NICs that we were putting into our servers at the time. If we fast forward to 2016, we actually now have custom silicon. We are delivering 25 gig connections to these individual servers. And we have custom ASICs here to do all of this processing for us in the hardware. This enabled the second generation of enhanced networking. And it means that we are now in full control of everything from the hardware right the way through to the software stack, even within the individual servers that are providing this offload of the virtualization. OK, so these cards and these ASICs are within servers. So here's an example of one of our, our previous generations of servers that we have within the AWS data centers. As you can see, it's actually a pretty simple one new server. There's nothing particularly special about it, except that we have built these based on data. We know that actually this is the most efficient use at the time of space within our data centers. You might think that there's a, a whole lot of empty space there. We could fit a whole other server in there. But actually, this is the most efficient way to run servers in the data centers. The power supplies and the voltage regulators run at over 90% efficiency. And obviously, these have now evolved, and we have newer generations of these designs. But it's quite interesting to see that this compares really quite well to some of the, the other cloud servers that have been published um, fairly recently in the press. So back to our architecture diagram. We now need to have a bit of a closer look at VPC itself. Now, on the diagram here, you can see that I have a VPC, I have a CIDR range, a block of IP addresses assigned to this VPC, individual smaller ranges of IP addresses assigned to the subnets within this VPC, and then finally, of course, our EC2 instances have an IP address. So how did we build VPC? What were we considering when we put together this particular solution? Well, the requirements for VPC were actually fairly simple. First of all, we wanted to build a network where customers could choose their IP addresses, where they were in full control of what happened within that VPC in terms of their networking and their routing. We wanted to enable simple routing from other remote networks. So if you're going to connect your VPC back to your on-premises network, you don't want to install hundreds of small individual routes for individual EC2 instances. You want a nice, simple, aggregated route announcement that you can then install into your route tables, and the VPC just becomes an extension of your network. We also wanted the concepts to be fairly familiar to our customers. So we wanted to conform to the idea of existing network designs and established practices. So terms like subnets. Networking teams are familiar with those terms. But we also didn't want to limit the size of those subnets to be, say, slash 24s. And actually, this is something that we heard from uh, one of our early customers. Um, that their current infrastructure was set up to purely manage their network based on slash 24 networks. That's fine. You can do that in VPC. But if you want to go smaller down to, say, a slash 28, that's also fine. So let's take a look at the components that make up VPC itself and the, the connectivity elements that we're going to talk through for the rest of the session. The example we have here is a corporate data center. It's using 192.168.16 as its network address range. And that's very simple in terms of routing. Inside that data center, all of the routers in the equipment have an entry that says, if you're trying to send traffic to 192.168, stay here. You don't need to go out of the, the data center, out of the, the network itself. Remember, our goal, though, was to then be able to define another network where the customer can define the IP address range. So the first thing to consider is we don't want these IP addresses to overlap. So in this case, the customer has chosen a 172.31.18 size network. OK, that's the definition of the virtual private cloud that they've created. We want to connect that back. So we're going to have to have some sort of gateway on our VPC. So this is the, the virtual private gateway. And it's used to provide connectivity over VPNs and over Direct Connect back to corporate data centers. We need a way to refer to the piece of equipment that sits on the other end of this connection. So we refer to this as the customer gateway. And we haven't yet got an API call that, that can cause a router to just appear in a customer data center. But this is the, the object that we use to represent it in the AWS console in our APIs. 
So now we have two ends of a connection. As you can expect, the next logical step is we need to connect them together. And in this case, going back to the early days of VPC, this was intended that it could be a VPN connection, so a standard IPsec VPN to connect the virtual private gateway to the customer gateway. So let's go back into the VPC itself. We've got this new address range that we've created, this 172.31 range. How do we configure the routing? Well, because it's one single CIDR block, it's really easy. Within the customer's data center, you'd simply have a route that says, if I'm sending traffic to 172.31 slash 18, send it over the VPN connection. One single route that represents all of that customer infrastructure that is running inside the VPC. Now let's divide the VPC down a little bit further. Let's create those subnets. So in this case, I'm using a fairly standard slash 24. A lot of customers do this. They take their 172.31 network that they've created and create a couple of subnets. So here they are. Once we've got our subnets, we can now launch EC2 instances. And when this instance launches, it comes up and it has an IP address, 172.31.1.7. Fantastic. This is where all customers start. They launch their first EC2 instance. Then hopefully they launch another one and another one, and the environment keeps growing. But at some point, they might then wish to terminate some of those instances, perhaps scale down some of their infrastructure after they've dealt with some peak load for their particular business. So some of those instances go away. But overall, you can see we've not had to change any of the routing that we configured. Nothing about the VPN has changed. Nothing about the on-premises routing. It's still 172.31 routing over this VPN connection. So we no longer have to make these huge amounts of routing table updates in a customer environment. We're not putting individual slash 32 routes into the customer's data centers. We've solved this problem. But actually, if we just pause there for a second, doesn't this just sound like virtual networking that we've had for quite a long time? These are not unfamiliar concepts. You know, a subnet, actually, you could consider that something like a VLAN in a, in a traditional data center. It's not quite the same, but, but similar. A VPC itself, isn't that just a VRF, a virtual routing and forwarding instance? And if you're not familiar with what that is, it's effectively a, a very similar thing to a VLAN, but at layer three. So we, we've got these concepts. But there's actually a few issues with this. And the first one to consider is scaling. Let's take VLANs as our starting point, VLAN IDs. It's made up from a 12-bit identifier. That means we can have 4,096 VLANs. Now, we've publicly said we have millions of customers, and a million is larger than 4,096. So this doesn't quite work for us. Even if we look at VRFs, now, VRFs, they can, we can support quite a few of those on some of those large traditional routers that I mentioned, perhaps a couple of thousand of them. That's still less than we need to be able to support. So this isn't going to work. There's also, quite generally, a fixed ratio here between the amount of VLANs that you can have associated with a particular VRF. Overall, this is not going to be a fit for VPC. So then we stepped back and considered what are our actual requirements for VPC again. And overall, we simplified this down to the fact that we wanted to be able to scale VPC to be able to support millions of environments that are the size of Amazon.com. We wanted any server anywhere in a region to be able to host customer EC2 instances on any subnet in that VPC and be able to communicate with each other. So let's dive into the detail of how we actually built this. So a couple of concepts first. Here we're looking at a particular set of servers in a VPC, or that make up the components of a VPC. So these are the underlying physical servers running the virtual machines, the EC2 instances physical hosts within Amazon data centers. They have IP addresses on our substrate network. This is 192.168 in the example shown on the screen here. And these servers can all communicate with each other. We then have customers' EC2 instances. And you will have seen that EC2 instances are associated with a VPC identifier. So in this case, we've got a customer EC2 instance running on 10.0.0.2. It's running in a blue VPC. That's the, the term we're going to use here, rather than putting identifiers on the screen. And this customer is actually running multiple EC2 instances. And when they've launched, they've actually launched onto different underlying servers within our data centers. So we've got three EC2 instances running here, all owned by the same customer, all in the blue VPC. Now, we've also got some other customers running on these servers that I'm showing you here. So we have the green VPC, which has two EC2 instances running, again, on different underlying servers. 
And we also have the gray VPC. In this case, two instances happen to be running on the same underlying server. The other core component of VPC is not something that we expose to you as a customer, so you can't access this directly, but it's absolutely a critical component of VPC, and it's the mapping service. The mapping service keeps track of EC2 instances associated with particular VPCs, and it maps those, and it provides that information to the underlying servers that make up the VPC environment. So I'm just going to pause there to explain a concept around how Layer 2 Ethernet actually works. This is back in a, a traditional environment. This is how things have been done for many, many years, and it's probably a fairly familiar concept to you if you've done anything with networking. We've got two servers here. They're on the 10 dot network. They're in the same subnet, 10.002 and 10.003. They're connected to a simple Ethernet switch. If those two servers want to exchange traffic, there's a process they have to go through. And let's assume these have all just been turned on. This is a, a fresh environment. What actually happens is that first server says, I want to send some traffic to 10.003. And it does something called ARP, Address Resolution Protocol. And what actually happens here is we take the MAC address, the physical address of that server on the left-hand side, the 10.002, and we do a broadcast. That's what the FFF is that's shown here on the screen. So we do a broadcast and say, where is 10.003? How do I get to it? Where is its physical address on this Ethernet network? The Ethernet switch, which has also recently just been booted up, says, I don't know. So it floods the network. And it passes on that request to every port on, it, on that device. The server that is 10.003 actually replies, and it says, yes, I'm over here, and here's my MAC address. Here's how you can send traffic to me over the physical network. The Ethernet switch captures that, stores it, but it then passes the reply back to 10.002 and says, pass your traffic over the network to this MAC address. This is how normal operating systems expect to work in a traditional environment. And obviously, those same operating systems are used within AWS. So now, once we have this ARP entry resolved, we can now send traffic. We can send ICMP, TCP, UDP, no problem, between these two servers on our traditional network. But how does that actually work inside VPC? So let's go back to our environment here. It's the same environment we were looking at earlier. We've got the underlying servers running some EC2 instances. We've got our server here at the top, 10.002. It wants to send some traffic to 10.003. It's the exact same scenario we looked at on the traditional Ethernet network. The operating system ARPs for it. That's what it expects to do. It's the same operating system. However, at this point, what we actually do is we take that request and we pass it on to the mapping service. So the underlying server sends a request to the mapping service that says, I'm hosting an EC2 instance, and I have traffic that I need to send to blue VPC, because that's my VPC, and I want to send it to the instance that has the address 10.003. Can you tell me where that is? So the mapping service replies, and it's quite simple. It says, yep, I know where that is. I've got a mapping for it. It's actually running over on the physical host, 192.168.1.4. So that goes back to the underlying hypervisor for EC2. We then pass that back to the instance. So now, as far as the EC2 instance is concerned, it got what appears to be a completely normal ARP reply. We give it a MAC address for that remote instance, and everyone is happy on there. You'll notice that at no point was there communication with that destination instance. So it's an interesting element from traditional networks. It turns out you don't actually need to see those ARP requests on the destination server. So now we need to send some traffic. So OK, we've got our, our instance again, 10.002. Let's send that traffic. So we now address it to the MAC address for 10.003, just like we would on a, a traditional network, and we send that packet. This is our ICMP, our TCP traffic across the network. What actually happens here, though, is the underlying server that's running this EC2 instance wraps that packet. So it wraps it with a, a label on it that says this is blue. This is the blue VPC. And because of that mapping service lookup that we did earlier, it knows what to do with it. So it then puts on top of that a new destination for this wrapped packet. And it says pass it across the network to the server that is 192.168.1.4. Great, that traffic flows across the underlying EC2 network and arrives on that remote server. Now, we don't actually deliver it at this point. What actually happens is that server says, I just need to validate this. So that server checks in with the mapping service again. And it says, I've just received a packet 
that came from a blue VPC, and the address on the source of that packet was 10.0.0.2. Can you just confirm for me that that EC2 instance exists on that source server? And the mapping service says, yes, that's absolutely a valid mapping. You can accept that packet. So now the hypervisor passes that packet onto the EC2 instance, and you receive it inside your operating system. So now we have traffic flowing between two EC2 instances that are on the same subnet. And that's the analogy back to the, the traditional Ethernet-based network. OK, what about isolation inside VPC? So here I am down in the gray VPC now. I've got 10.0.0.4, and I decide I want to send some traffic to 10.0.0.3. Now, there are no EC2 instances on this network that have the address 10.0.0.3 in the gray VPC. But OK, so the underlying hypervisor says, yeah, I, I see that you want to send this packet. I'll check in with the mapping service. Mapping service, can you tell me where gray 10.0.0.3 is? The mapping service says, hmm, OK, gray. Yep, I can look that up. Um, this is a corrupt mapping. This is not something that you should be trying to send. And even though the fact that you tried to send it in the first place, something's gone wrong here. So at that point, we deny the mapping, and we will notify an operator to have a look into what happened here. This is not a situation that should ever occur. So the mapping service has present, prevented that packet from flowing anywhere. OK, so we now have another broadcast happening here. It's saying, I would like to find the um, EC2 instance 10.0.0.3 again. So I do the broadcast go back to the mapping service, and let's say in this case, something actually got corrupted on the way. And for whatever reason, this now says, I'm actually looking for blue. So I tried to send a packet to gray, 10.0.0.3, but actually the query went to the mapping service as blue, 10.0.0.3. The mapping service says, hang on a second, 192.168.0.4, the underlying server, doesn't host any instances in the blue VPC. Therefore, again, this is wrong. This mapping is denied, and an alarm will get raised again for investigation. This is something that should never occur, but it is built into the mapping service to validate these packets. OK, so let's assume that we did get a valid mapping. You know, I'm stacking up very, very improbable, unlikely things here. Let's say we did get a response. So we got a response that said, yep, OK, we're going to wrap this in the blue VPC. We're going to send it across the network, and we're sending it to 192.168.1.4. So I'm now trying to get from a gray VPC to a blue VPC. OK, so that packet tries to flow. Gets sent across the network. The underlying server that hosts blue 10.0.0.3, remember what it did before. It checks back in with the mapping service. And it says, I just want to validate the fact. Do you have a blue 10.0.0.4 at that original server? And the answer, of course, is no. This is an invalid mapping. Therefore, once again, let's raise an alarm. This is something that should not happen. That packet never gets delivered to the underlying EC2 instance. It's stopped by the hypervisor. This is the isolation that VPC provides and the multiple layers that we have in place to prevent these packets flowing if they should not make it to the destination EC2 instance. OK, so we've talked about traffic flowing within the same subnet. What about if we're going between two different subnets, so layer three routing? So similar scenario here. We have a server in a traditional network running on 10.0.0.2, and it's trying to send traffic to 10.0.1.3. Now, in a traditional environment, what would happen here is 10.0.0.2 knows that it can't reach 10.0.1.3 directly. It's not on the same subnet. So instead, it knows that it needs to find the default gateway. So we go through the similar dance that we did before. We talked to the Ethernet switch, but instead of looking for 10.0.1.3, what we're now looking for is the default gateway to get out of this particular subnet. So we, this time we arc for 10.0.0.1, our default gateway out of this particular subnet. The Ethernet switch floods the network, or perhaps it already has an existing entry in its arc table, and it provides a reply. And it says 10.0.0.1, yep, that's located over here on this physical address for the router. Fine, so we can now send a packet from our source server on 10.0.0.2. And we, at layer three, know we want to address it to 10.0.1.3. We know it's trying to get to this destination. But the first hop we have to get through is that physical router. So the MAC address that we send this traffic to is actually the interface on that router. So now we're at the router. Fantastic. The router then does its job, and it changes that source MAC address and passes it onto the other segment of the network passes it down to the Ethernet switch, 
and onto that server. So this is how layer three routing works in a traditional network. How does that work inside VPC? So let's go back to this very familiar diagram now that you've seen a few times. We've got the same EC2 instance at the top, but this time it's trying to send a packet to 10.0.0.1 first, because that's what it thinks is its default gateway. Remember, it's trying to send to something outside of its subnet. So as far as the operating system is concerned, it needs to do the same thing as it would do in a traditional environment. What happens here, of course, is the underlying server checks in with the mapping service and says, I have a query for blue 10.0.0.1. The mapping service says, yep, I know what you're looking for here. Here's a MAC address for it. It doesn't actually need to go and talk to anyone else. And the underlying hypervisor passes that back to the EC2 instance. Everything's good. The EC2 instance then says, fantastic, I will send my packet. And I know that I need to send it to the MAC address for the router on my network. That's the, the image that it has of the network. So here we are. We have a source address here, the MAC address of the EC2 instance. We have a source IP address. Destination address, again, it's in a different subnet. But the destination MAC address is on my same segment. It's a physical MAC address that I'm sending to as far as the instance is concerned. What actually happens is the underlying hypervisor kind of ignores that. It says, where did you actually want to send this traffic? You wanted to send it to 10.0.1.3. We care about the layer 3 IP address here in a different subnet. We go to the mapping service. We actually ask, where is that IP address? We get a response, and the traffic can now flow directly across the network. It never touched a router. It was passed across the network in exactly the same way that layer 2 traffic is passed. This means that our layer 3 virtual topology is actually totally decoupled from the physical infrastructure. It's decoupled from that traditional image of the way that a network should behave. And it means that we can deliver very fast performance equally at layer 3 or layer 2 across our network in that sense. So here's our packet. We can now wrap it in our blue uh, label that we said. We're going to pass it across the substrate. We're going to pass it across to 192.168.1.4. Once again, we're going to check in with the mapping service. We need to validate that this packet was allowed to come from that source host server and be passed onto this particular destination server. The mapping service says, yes, this is a valid mapping. Please deliver that packet. Nowhere in there did we actually hit a router within the environment. But the operating systems believe that it behaved in a perfectly normal way, exactly as it would have in a traditional network. OK. now. It's probably quite clear here that the mapping service potentially represents a point of failure within this environment. Now, that's clearly not the case. Also, you might consider that every time we do those lookups, actually, that's introducing some latency into the packet flow. And that goes against some of our design goals for VPC. The thing is, the mapping service has full visibility into where things are placed within the environment. And these are organized into topics and published such that these underlying servers can consume them. What that means in reality is that we actually deploy a cache onto these underlying servers. And actually, these caches actually contain all the mappings for the EC2 instances involved in the VPCs and the EC2 instances running on that particular server. And that means we actually didn't implement a cache mispath here. Everything is queried against that local cache, which is sourced from the topics provided by the mapping service itself. So they are populated. The caches subscribe to that mapping service, receive the updates. So whenever you make changes to your VPC, whenever you launch new EC2 instances, the mapping service is updated, as are those local caches. So we can now go back to our original concept here. We have our VPC with our instances running inside that particular VPC. But you'll remember we said this needs to be connected back to our existing corporate network. In this example, we were using a VPN. So how does that work? Everything we've talked about in terms of packet flow within our VPC is all inside the VPC itself. So we can do this quite easily. We can send traffic from one instance to another. We can even send it between subnets in different availability zones. But how do we get home? How do we get back to that data center? If we had a packet inside our VPC, and we this time address it to a 172 address, so in this case, 172.16 is outside of our VPC. This is the corporate data center. What does the mapping service do with it? It says, I want to send standard ICMP, UDP, TCP traffic from an instance to this IP address that is not within the VPC. It gets wrapped in the blue headers again. So OK, we know it came from a blue VPC. Still not any closer to actually getting out of this environment. 
What we really want to do here, though, is send it somewhere else. So what is the destination for this packet? It's no longer going to another server. It no longer is going to another EC2 instance. So this is where the concept of edges comes in. So within our VPC, an edge is represented just the same as those other servers. An edge has an IP address, in this case, 192.168.4.3 and 4.4. When our EC2 instance wants to send a packet to an address that is outside the VPC, we look that up with the mapping service, and we realize that due to the VPN configuration, we can reach this over the VPN. The mapping service says, OK, what you need to do here is pass that traffic over to one of the edges. So here's our, our familiar dance again. We have the packet leaving the instance, this time destined for that remote IP address. It goes across the network, having checked in with the mapping service as normal, and it now arrives at the edge. It's got the blue wrapper around it, and it was destined to this particular edge. And this edge is handling VPN connections. So what do we want to do with a VPN piece of traffic? Well, what we want to do, of course, is use that edge to remove anything that is not valid on a VPN connection and replace it with everything that is. So in this particular case, once it hits the edge, what we do is we strip off that wrapper that said this came from a blue, a blue VPC. IPsec VPNs don't know anything about our VPCs. And what the edge does is it replaces it with a whole bunch of IPsec stuff, encryption, all the things you need to be able to send this packet across the IPsec VPN. It changes the source and destination, because if you're going across the, the VPN, you now need to be sending it to the customer gateway on the other side, which will then decrypt the packet and deliver it onto the local network. So this is what a VPN edge does. What about Direct Connect? I mentioned that at the very beginning of the talk. Direct Connect is that physical connection back to your data center. The way Direct Connect works is you provision what are called virtual interfaces. These use VLANs. You can have all of the VLANs available to a particular customer on an individual port. So there's no real limitations there. But in this case, when we receive a packet at the edge for Direct Connect, what we need to do is remove that blue wrapper, and this time encapsulate it with a .1Q VPN, uh, VLAN header. We also then change the next hop for the packet, and we pass it down that Direct Connect to the customer's router. So that's what a, a Direct Connect edge does within VPC. So this is great. We can get traffic home. But actually, it's quite common for customers to want to be able to send traffic to and from the internet. So how does the internet gateway work? When you create an internet gateway in your VPC and you attach it, it's an object that you attach. It's available to the whole of that VPC. But how does it actually work? Well, once again, that's an edge. So the internet gateway in the underlying VPC infrastructure is represented by an edge. We take our blue wrapped packet here. We pass it to the edge. Now, this is where things are a little bit different, because out on the internet, we don't care about VLANs. We don't care about IPsec encryption. And therefore, what do we do with this particular packet? We currently have a source address of a private IP address inside our VPC 10.0.0.2, but we're sending it to a public IP address out on the internet. What we actually want to do here is remove anything else around this packet. We want this to be a standard IP packet when it goes out to the internet. But there's still a problem. That source IP address, that's not valid out on the internet. It's a private IP address. So what the Internet Gateway does here is it replaces that with a public IP address. This might be an elastic IP, for example, that you've assigned to the EC2 instance, or just a public IP that you chose to enable when you launched it. So the Internet Gateway Edge replaces those IP addresses, effectively does that translation for you. So there's an example there of three different edges, a VPN edge, Direct Connect, and the Internet Gateway. But I also just briefly wanted to mention VPC endpoints. So we have VPC endpoints for S3. We have VPC endpoints currently in preview for DynamoDB. They work in exactly the same way. Traffic is passed to an edge. It is then encapsulated as needed to then be delivered to those other AWS services. So what have we actually now created? Well, we have a VPC, but this is actually a platform where you can launch other services. These are not just EC2 instances that you choose to launch in your account. You might decide that you want to use Normal EC2 instances, but alongside that, you want an RDS environment, a relational database. Now, RDS is a managed service by AWS, but you want it to have an IP address inside your VPC. That's fine. VPC enables you to do that. You might decide that you need to use Redshift. And again, that can have a presence inside your VPC. And the advantage is, because these are inside your VPC, you can also reach them from that on-premises network. 
This environment is an extension of your existing data center and existing infrastructure. So with that, to go back to the original architecture we started with, we've talked through the traffic flow path from your data center over Direct Connect into your VPC and back again using the edges. We've talked about traffic flow over the Amazon global network from our CloudFront pops right the way through into the EC2 instances that might be acting as the origins for your content for CloudFront. And within the VPC itself, we've got our EC2 instances that can communicate with each other across availability zones using their private IP addresses, and this is an isolated environment for each individual customer. So with that, I think we've met the requirements of describing the flow of billions of packets across the AWS network. I hope that's been useful to you and provides a bit of an insight into how we operate our environment. Thank you very much.